I, um, yeah. Yes, yes, are you there? Okay. doing it yet? Okay. Yes, I think it's being recorded. Okay. Let me just see. Yeah, it's uh, being recorded. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the NIAS uh, discussion meeting. In today's uh, meeting, Dr. Professor Sharada Srinivasan uh, will be speaking on a long-term project that she has been very intimately associated with, uh, which is preserving the cultural heritage of Hampi. Uh, and much of this is in the digi digital medium. Uh, but I will leave it to Sharada to speak about this. Sharada. So uh, thank you so much, Anandya. And uh, it's nice to be here on this uh, NIAS Wednesday discussion meeting. And thank you to many of the colleagues and guests also who expressed interest in logging in. So um, uh, 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 today I'm uh, going to be talking about Hampi as a cultural and geological landscape some technical and digital perspectives. And as Anandya mentioned, it would uh, cover, uh, you know, a patchwork of various efforts. Um, uh, can you hear me properly? Do I need to wear headphones or anything? No, you're fine, uh, yeah? Sharada. At least, okay. yeah, you seem fine. to be quite audible. All right. So um, I should try to share my screen in that case uh, without further ado. And, um, Yes, you can see your screen. Could you go to display mode? Uh, Sharad, to display mode. Yeah, the full screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. So is that all right? Yes, yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, great. So, um, uh, of course, you're looking at uh, some of the spectacular uh, setting of Hampi, uh, which is a very, as I said, it's a very unique landscape, both in terms of the cultural significance and the geological significance, um, set within a very, uh, the old uh, geological formations of the Archaeomyces and so on. And that's also part of the uh, dramatic nature of the setting. And of course, this is one of the more uh, recently excavated uh, pushkarnis or the tanks, which is um, just as you're uh, driving up to the Vitella temple. And uh, uh, this is also one of the features of Hampi that it was very famous for, the ir irrigation networks and tanks and aqueducts and so on. Um, well, uh, the World Heritage Site of Hampi in Karnataka, of course, encompasses the spectacular ruins of the medieval metropolis of the Vijayanagara Empire, which flourished from about the 14th to 16th century uh, CE in uh, southern India. And uh, this is, uh, of course, a view of the Achyutaraya temple complex. And as you can see, of course, the uh, this particular complex is of, uh, you know, that reaches a culmination of the uh, Dravidian style of temple building that uh, was well developed going back to the Chola period in the Tamil heartland. And that is what the uh, Vijayanagara rulers also um, uh, adopted to a large extent. And you can see here that uh, the uh, it, it, there is a the, the, the prakara or the quadrangle is there and the gopura or the temple tower, which is in this case made with a stone base and then the brick tower superstructure on top of it. And uh, the, of course, uh, the location of Hampi is, as mentioned, is also very spectacular. It's in the midst of these um, arcane niases and granites. And uh, they are typically what are known as the Inselbergs, these um, isolated outcrops of granite here and there, uh, within which this uh, cultural landscape is set. And of course, uh, the uh, Vijayanagara 
dynasties were founded by Harihara and Bukka going back to 1336 CE. And... Uh, was ruled by numerous powerful uh, kings such as Krishna Devaraya in the early 16th century. And Vijayanagara or the city of victory was compared in beauty and size to Rome by travelers such as the Portuguese traveler Domingo Pais and so on. And it was also visited by Abdul Razak in 1443. And uh, here you're looking also at, uh, since I was trying to also make this point about uh, why this is a very distinctive cultural and geological landscape, so to speak, because you see this uh, very beautiful alternation of these isolated outcrops, these inselbergs, and the temple uh, setting very much woven into all of this. And this is, a, you know, the um, uh, Malaya Vantaragunata temple that you're looking at uh, over here. And uh, so again, in this case, the, there's, there's the stone base and then uh, some of the brick superstructures and so on. And uh, um, in fact, in some of this particular temple is also actually built right within uh, some of these granitic outcrops of porphyritic granite, as it were. And uh, uh, the, the best known or the living temple of uh, the uh, group of Hampi, uh, temple complexes and so on is the Virupaksha temple, which flanks the Pampa River, which is a tributary of the Tungabhadra. And you're looking here at uh, below at the view of the Virupaksha temple complex with the sacred tank and so on. And of course, there were also the bazaars uh, leading up to uh, the temple, such as the Virupaksha temple and so on. Um, and uh, so uh, sometime going back to around uh, 2009, I think it was, we'd had a seminar on the tangible and intangible heritage of Hampi. And thereafter, there was uh, this project which was supported by DST. I think it began sometime, of course, the preparation time leading up to it. And then I think in 2011, we uh, began in earnest. And it was a multi-institutional collaboration involving uh, several institutions, the IITs and uh, IIT Madras, IIT Delhi, initially also IIT Bombay and uh, the NIDs and uh, IACD and so on, I triple ITs and such like. And each of the different uh, principal investigators were looking at a different uh, set of uh, aspects of uh, the cultural heritage of Hampi and looking at how uh, digital technologies can help us to better represent and document the heritage. And there was also, uh, I mean, by way of the historiography, I should mention, there was also um, a digital Hampi workshop and exhibition which took place in uh, 2014. Uh, at the Habitat Center, and as you can see, that was uh, the beginning of um, one of the uh, attempts at the 3D models and so on of the uh, uh, Vitella Temple complex. And um, there was also the attempt at using uh, kinect-based interaction and so on to um, uh, and augmented reality to to ground the sites and such like. And then this also led to a book, uh, The Digital Humpy, which was published by Springer and uh, came out some years ago. So, um, well, and at that time, of course, uh, we, we lost Professor Shetter uh, practically a year ago. He was a very eminent uh, historian uh, and also former chairman of the Indian um, uh, Council for Historical Research and a longstanding uh, faculty member of NIAS and uh, also a, a leading authority on um, art and architecture in Karnataka and also Hampi. And uh, so he had also been uh, taking a keen interest in the project as, as one of the uh, uh, people to have got it going in the initial stages. And at the bottom there, you're looking at one of the photographs of the team, as it were, in Hampi uh, many years ago at the Lotus Mahal. And uh, of course, another very interesting aspect of the Vijayanagara architectural heritage is this uh, very eclectic mix of architectural styles and elements drawn from very diverse milieus, um, both uh, what we might call indo and eco islamic as well as the Hindu uh, temple building traditions and so on. And also from Jain, uh, uh, previous Jain architectural features. For example, here at the Lotus Mahal, if you look at the pyramidal superstructure, 
Uh, that actually calls to mind some of the Jain uh, temples, which you also see still on the Hemakuta Hill, uh, which is leading up to the Virupaksha temple. And uh, of course, the pyramidal uh, structure, which you superstructure, which is then also uh, very much a part of the Hindu temple building tradition. But you also he see here the uh, use of the Islamic style arches and so on. So, and this was the Lotus Mahal was thought of in the Zanana area for the women and so on. And just to point out what uh, one can do with uh, digital means. So we were in collaboration with uh, the Karnataka Council for Science and Technology, which is also one of the partnering agencies, uh, which has a campus near the ISC uh, um, itself. And uh, so they had been undertaking to do the aspect of the laser scanning of the monuments and uh, uh, using terrestrial uh, 3D laser scanning, uh, many of the monuments of Hampi actually were then uh, scanned so that, uh, so what this does is that you have a, a, a laser uh, line which, uh, uh, you know, goes on to the monument and then um, uh, the, the reflections and so on are picked up by sensors, two sensors, and so that uh, can also judge the distance of the laser and the position of the laser and so on. And so using that really a point cloud is generated, a 3D point cloud. And then that 3D point cloud has all the coordinates of the monument or the object which is being laser scanned. And as you can see here, this is a very spectacular rendition from the 3D point cloud of the Lotus Mahal in totality. And uh, so that actually shows up in, in maybe some more details and so on, uh, some of the features, of course, you can see the Jarokas. Again, talking about this mix of traditions, you also see these Jaroka type windows, which perhaps reminds more of Western Indian or um, Rajasthani architecture and so on also are coming in uh, here. And you can also see how the laser scanning uh, shows up much more clearly the aspects of the architecture and the superstructure as well as the plinth and the, uh, the these buttress arches and so on, the numbers of them and all of these features. So, um, and amongst the other studies uh, that had been undertaken was also the documentation of the uh, bazaar through uh, digital perspectives. And in that, uh, one of the research associates uh, who was involved initially with the NID and then also with NIAS was Pallavi Thakur. And so there was also an attempt to uh, look at the uh, the mandapas and so on, which typically line some of the bazaars, such as the Virupaksha. And of course, this is a photograph of the Virupaksha temple Gokura and the tank next to it. This was taken by me back in 2003. After that, of course, and for, well, fortunately, unfortunately, I don't know, but uh, I think I preferred the pristine version. It has undergone some restoration and so on, but this is what the temple steps did look like um, initially. And uh, so the Virupaksha temple complex, of course, is also uh, well known for the uh, Stalapuna Purana, or the legend of uh, uh, Pampa, uh, the marriage of Pampa and Shiva. Uh, or Girija Kalyanam and so on, um, as, as Pampa is seen as a form of Parvati. And uh, this temple, and so this is, uh, in fact, some of the the older portions of uh, Hampi are related to this, this legend. And there is also the chariot procession and the uh, jatres and so on uh, related to the Girija Kalyanam and um, uh, enactments and such like of this um, uh, uh, mythic uh, aspect and such like. And uh, of course, the, the uh, Virupaksha temple had been begun uh, by Devaraya in the 14th century, and the Gopura editions and so on are thought to have been made by Krishna Devaraya in the 16th century. Um, and uh, I don't know if, how many of you actually got a chance to go to Delhi uh, last year, this around this time in between January and February. So there was a uh, Two month long uh, exhibition in the National Museum called uh, Indian Digital Heritage in, um, um, in, in, in Digital Space, Indian Heritage in Digital Space. And so that had uh, several of these room size 3D prints and so on uh, made from the laser scans of the various monuments and others also uh, printouts from um, the uh, Google SketchUp and uh, AutoCAD. Um, models and so on of the various uh, 
conjectural reconstructions of uh, the site and the, some of the monuments. And as you can see here, one of the models that was put up was of the uh, bazaar scenes and uh, the Rathotsava festival. And there were also some augmented reality um, uh, displays and things like that of um, um, uh, um, surrounding some of these exhibits and such like. And uh, just to give you a sense of what the um, reality on the ground, of course, the Hampi Jatre is one of the very well-known um, cultural festivals of a very much of a local nature, which has been taking place in Hampi over the years. And you can see that there is this beautiful wooden chariot and these umbrellas and so on, which uh, were put out. This is going back to the 90s when uh, Professor Shetter had written his book. And this is still, of course, an important festival, although uh, you know now there's some emphasis being put on some of the other kinds of festivals which have been introduced, like the Hampi Utsava and so on. And uh, of course, the Rathotsava, the chariot festival, is also an aspect that uh, is an important part of the intangible heritage and also finds a lot of mention in the inscriptions and the travelers' accounts and so on. And Abdul Razak, uh, the Persian traveler in the 15th century, also spoke of the teeming bazaars, which sold precious gems and flowers and so on. And uh, this is to give you some of the ideas of, of the conjectural reconstructions and 3D reconstructions of some of the uh, uh, mandapas and so on, which was undertaken partly by uh, the team from NID along with Pallavi and so on. Well, uh, of course, the geological formations around Hampi, uh, which is part of the Arcane Nias, are amongst the oldest in India and, in fact, in the world. And it forms a very dramatic landscape of what we typically call pink porphyritic granite. And I was talking about the Inselbergs or these isolated uh, formations. And then uh, the granite has, over time, through the process of weathering and so on, sort of uh, cleaved and fractured to form these bun-shaped loaves and slabs and boulders. And actually, when you look at it, I think that uh, you can immediately tell that the way the granite has fractured itself has, in a way, been exploited in terms of the use of the architectural elements. For instance, you have the elongated slabs, which are then being used as uh, the lintels and columns and so on uh, quite easily. So you have very large uh, lintels and uh, such like. And, of course, the um, typical trabeate or lintel uh, type architecture, which you associate with Hindu temple building, is abundantly found, uh, you know, in the mandapas and so on. But you also have the influence of the Deccani Sultanate architecture uh, from the northern part of Karnataka and so on. And uh, so in those influences, you also see that they're using uh, the same uh, building material um, in different ways, making vuzwar. Uh, arches as well. You can see the elephant stables here, which has the typical uh, Vuzbar arch, which is um, associated much more with the indo sassanic or Islamic style of temple building. So you can see that the same granite has been used in a, a very uh, diff wide array of architectural styles. And why I'm mentioning this is also because I think uh, it's also important to recognize, I mean, now there's a lot of interest in what are characterized as heritage stones for instance, the Portland masonry in, in, in England is also recognized as a heritage stone. And I think a couple of years ago, also the um, uh, Makrana marble um, associated with the Taj Mahal uh, coming from Rajasthan and so on has also been associated or has been uh, designated as a heritage stone. And I think that this porphyritic granite of uh, the Hampi landscape also perhaps over time deserves to be listed as a heritage stone because it. As you know, there's a lot of indiscriminate granite quarrying um, all around um, in, in Karnataka and so on, uh, because, again, granite is valued a lot as a building material and flooring and exported and so on. And I think every time we fly down into Bangalore, I can see that there are whole hillocks which have disappeared. And then there's just a, a huge cavity with water left where there was some, you know, beautiful granite formations and so on. So I think... And many of us also aware that there are several of these, I, I also touch upon that, these megaliths and so on, other kinds of uh, um, archaeological formations and features and so on, which uh, uh, also, you know, get destroyed when, you know, you bring down some of these rock formations and they may have had rock shelters and so many other things. 
Um, and of course, was, the other interesting aspect of Hampi is the way that you see this interplay of different types of building materials as well. This is the Malayavanta Raghunatha temple of the 16th century, which is associated with the Tuluva dynasty. And uh, here you, you see that the natural bedrock itself is, is used, um, you know, so you get this sense of, uh, uh, you know, the shikara, which is basically what the, the central um, uh, tower is, is often referred to, which conveys the mountain. So there is this sense of the shikara here, and then the vimana actually comes out, emerges out of this uh, uh, rock formation, which, which is um, at the base of it. And... Uh, well, another important aspect is I was talking about the uh, the prehistory of this region around Hampi and so on. I don't have time too much to go into it, but uh, I have been working with a team from the University of Chicago and University of Michigan, uh, of Kathy Morrison and Carla Sinopoli, who had been uh, undertaking a megalithic excavation up in Anegundi, which is the older part of Hampi. Um, and... Uh, uh, you're looking here at the bottom here at Kadiba clay, which is near Anigundi, and this is overlooking the Tungabhadra River, a very spectacular site. And uh, so this has some rock shelters and uh, there was some megalithic uh, excavations and so on there and some iron implements and all that uncovered, which I've done some analysis of, but I didn't really want to go too much into the nitty gritty of the metalworking and so on, because the focus of this talk really is more on the digital heritage, which there's uh, fair enough, uh, you know, enough to say and talk about it as well. Uh, but as you can see, typically, you know, even in the rock formations, you see the quartz alternating with the, the, the dolerite dikes and the schists and so on. So uh, this wide range of uh, building material, which is available here. And uh, just to continue in that vein, uh, this is the portion of the Mahanavami Dibba, where uh, the Vijayadashmi procession is said to have taken place. And this was built by Krishna Devaraya in 1513 after the conquest over the Gajapati Orisan king. And uh, here again, you see this uh, use of different kinds of uh, building materials and building techniques. Um, so at, at the bottom, you see, of course, the granite, the porphyritic granite uh, uh, base. And uh, the, of course, porphyritic granite, what, what porphyritic granite actually means is that the porphyrites are basically uh, you have very large crystals of granite, which form when the original um, igneous rock was, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, was being formed. So you have some very large crystals, and then you have the other. Uh, uh, it, so these large crystals are in a matrix of very uh, fine, fine grained crystals as well. I mean, fine grained uh, uh, matrix of the igneous rock. So you have the large crystals, and that's why it's called the porphyritic granite. And uh, so you see that, of course, it's a very hard material, and that's why it's quite a shallow relief that you see. You see plenty of uh, um, horses and so on, because uh, there was a lot of trade also with the Arab world and so on, um, uh, because there's a lot of demand for war horses and so on. So you can see here some of the depictions also of camels and horses and all sorts of um, uh, pageantry and um, that kind of thing. And uh, you, you can, I also put this slide in because you can see very clearly how uh, it's also been faced with uh, this rather greenish looking rock. Some of it seems to be schist. Maybe there's some dolerite there, there as well. But of course, uh, the, the um, we're also talking about, you know, the, the region of the Sandur and so on is also close to the Dharwar schist. And there's a lot of the greenstone, uh, the greenstone belt, as it's called, a lot of schist is also available. Though not particularly at this site, so it have been brought in uh, from some surrounding areas. But you can see, for instance, at the top, there's a course with some very fine carvings, which, uh, you know, look to be elephants and so on. So the schist uh, could take some more of these uh, finer carvings. So some of the courses do have schist and um, some of it has dolerite and all sorts of uh, materials. And you can also see here that there's been some kind of rubble masonry and cladding and so on um, on the face of the um, Mana, Mitaba, and so on. So there is, I think, a lot to be uh, explored over there. Now, as I was talking about the uh, 
you know, the need to give this particular granite the tag of a heritage stone tag, which has also been um, awarded to the Makrana marble. And um, you could also make the case that this has been used for a very long time as well in um, architectural heritage. For instance, um, you're looking at uh, this very spectacular site of Hire Benkel, which is about 30 kilometers away from Hambi. And fortunately, it's a bit of an isolated site. So uh, some of it has been preserved, though a lot of it is getting um, destroyed, so to speak, because there's a lot of uh, uh, the stones and so on get taken away by some of the local people and used for building material. But this is a megalithic site and uh, going back to about 1000 BC. And uh, you can see the, the the dolmens and the capping stones and so on. And of course, I uh, the, my first visit, this must have been about 2003, which I had made when uh, the team from uh, of Kala Sinopoli and all of them were in, uh, when, um, in were visiting at that time when we were looking around at Anigundi and so on. And you can see that they're also, um, I'll also explain later how you get these uh, particular shapes in this granite and so on, but I'll come back to this a bit later, but I just wanted to put this in here at this point to also point to the antiquity in terms of uh, the working and manipulating this uh, porphyritic granite, um, which is uh, also, you know, makes it a worthy candidate of being described as a heritage stone, whether or not uh, it is actually ascribed those labels, I think is, is beside the point. Um, and uh, of course it did talk about the water architecture, but just to um, again point to the more well-known um, landmarks, you have this beautiful uh, stepped, uh, pyramidal stepped well, which is uh, again made of uh, something which seems to be more of the black schist, which is near the Mahanavami Dibba. And you also have aqueducts and so on uh, leading up to it. And of course, that also uh, is part of the broader uh, tradition of Kalyanis and step wells, which you also see in Chalukyan um, architecture and also in other uh, Western Indian um, um, uh, styles of step wells and so on. And you also have uh, here, I've put in the slide of the Queen's Bath, which is, um, um, at least it's, it's generally called the Queen's Bath. And again, that has some of this Jaroka kind of feature and uh, more of the Indo-Islamic kind of influence. Um, so now I'll uh, go on to some of the digital aspect because there's actually probably quite a lot to cover. So um, now in this slide, you're looking at uh, of course, a very spectacular Vitella temple complex in Hampi, which uh, has a hall with 56 pillars, which is said to have begun in, been begun in the era of Devaraya around circa 1424. And it was also sacked in the Battle of Talikota in 1565 by the Deccani Sultanates. And uh, some of it has probably also been uh, set fire to and so on. But uh, this is just to point out that we also have this very rich collection of early photographs of Hampi, which also makes it very uh, uh, an important resource in terms of understanding some of the features of this World Heritage Site, which have been lost over time. And uh, there were numerous photographers like Edmund David uh, Lyon and uh, Greenlaw and so on, who in the uh, uh, mid to latter part of the 19th century, uh, went around taking these really marvelous uh, photographs and albumin prints and so on. And in this case, uh, you can see here, this This is a photograph which is in the uh, Alkazi collection, which is in Delhi, uh, of the Vitala temple and the Mandapa and the chariot shrine and so on. And you can see that all of it actually had um, much better developed uh, uh, superstructures on top, some of which have collapsed. And you can see here also the famous uh, so-called chariot uh, shrine, which is one of the iconic features of Hampi. And you can see that it has a brick superstructure, but that brick superstructure has uh, has fallen uh, in the past, uh, 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 you know, in, in, in the past, in, in, in the recent centuries. So it's not only that some of the damage took place during the sack of Talikota, but it's also weathering due to the elements and man-made uh, natural feature, na natural uh, deterioration as well as uh, whatever may have been uh, man-made and so on. And uh, 
So this is the frontal part of the Vitella Temple complex. And you can see also at the bottom there, there is a uh, small uh, relief of, of Rama with a bow uh, inside of Prabhavali and so on. And uh, keep that in mind because I'll be coming back to the bronzes and that is what you actually see in, in some of the depictions in the bronzes. And uh, of course, um, on both sides of this, uh, uh, the uh, Vitala Temple Mandapa, you have these colonnades, which uh, are very slender colonnades. And some of them, not all of them, but certainly some of them on one side, more towards the left side, uh, they do tend to give these uh, tonalities and they tend to have resonant properties and hence uh, you know, they've been come to be labeled as musical pillars, and we'll come back to that as well as to uh, whether, how far we could go in terms of understanding that as um, intentional or whether it was also uh, due to the inherent property of stone contributing to these effects and such like. And uh, so this, of course, is the... Uh, closer view of this iconic structure of the chariot shrine to Garuda, which is um, Garuda as a Vahana to the Lord Vishnu. Um, and of course, although this has been called a Ratha, it is actually a shrine to Garuda because when you look inside, there is a figure of Garuda, which is inside the, uh, which has been carved at, inside the shrine, which is not very easy to see, but it, it is there. And as I was mentioning, the brick superstructure had collapsed and, you know, you also find that these wheels are a bit movable and uh, so on. And, uh, but it replicates quite uh, well the features of wooden uh, rathas or chariots and so on um, uh, in, in terms of the detail. And uh, so one of the projects that had been taken up was to also attempt to do the conjectural reconstruction of the superstructure of the chariot. And in this, um, the... Uh, pictures, the photographs which are in the Alkazi collection now of the albumin prints and so on, uh, such as by Edmund uh, David Leon and so on, those proved to be quite helpful to give a sense of what the superstructure may have been. And so, you know, along with other AutoCAD and movie sketch-up renditions and so on, uh, an attempt was made to, um, uh, to make a conjectural restoration of the missing bits of the superstructure and so on. So that is one of those attempts of the and uh, now this is coming to the exhibition so at the National Museum. So um, here what has actually been done in this exhibition is some parts of it are um, just the um, as is rendition by laser scanning the monuments and then making a 3D print uh, of the laser scan monuments. Can you still see me? Hello? Yes, we can see you. Oh, yeah. Okay, I was wondering if I'm having a technical glitch. Yeah, thanks. Um, but yeah. Presentation is off. Presentation is off. Yes. Oh, what happened? I don't know. I think you may have. That's what I was wondering because something popped up, and uh, so how do I go back to it? Can you just uh, start uh, sharing again, if possible? I think uh, for some reason you may have uh, been sort of your screen screen sharing may have stopped. Okay. Um, oh, right. Okay. So I go back here and I go back to the screen share, right? That's right. Yeah, because I didn't know what happened. Something popped up and then... Uh, yeah, for some reason, it I think it went off. Oh, Acha, and my PowerPoint is also closed now, so I have to open it again, I think. And, Yes, we can see it again. We can see you. Uh, we can see the presentation. Yeah, perfect. That's fine, okay. Sharma. Thanks very much. So um, what was done here is that, uh, as you mentioned, the laser scanning was done of the various monuments. And then uh, from the point clouds that were generated, uh, room-size 3D prints were made, uh, in this case, only of the Vitella Temple complex, really. 
um, using uh, this material called polylactase, which takes quite a lot of fine detail. So it's a one is to 14 scale and so on. Uh, but apart from that literal model, there was also an attempt to, um, in some cases, for instance, as you saw the Vitella temple, uh, the photograph that I showed you earlier, didn't really have much of a superstructure. So in this case, a conjectural reconstruction was made of the superstructure uh, based on um, some of the, uh, you know, what one can retrieve from the photographs, the um, 19th century photographs, and also discussions of the Stapatis and so on. So there's a mix of that. So you can see that digitally reconstructed a superstructure, which is not actually there anymore, and the actual um, uh, 3D print of the monument as is uh, of the Vitella Temple complex. And uh, just to give you a sense of the scale, there's also that uh, photograph with me. And then you can also see here this uh, chariot shrine with uh, Garuda. And uh, so you can see that actually it picks up quite a lot of the very um, uh, fine details as well. Uh, in, if you use a proper material for printing it, of course, and uh, so on. Um, and uh, there was also, of course, a display here, which, uh, you know, to do with, uh, there was a kind of hologram of, of the dancers in the middle of the Vitella temple and so on. So uh, there were quite a few other kinds of features and so on. Now, the reason why this shrine is also called uh, the Vitella temple is that it is dedicated to the pastoral form of Vishnu um, known as Vitella. And uh, this is a form, of course, which you don't really see in a very obvious way in, in, in the temple or in Hampi in general, it's there in more discrete ways. Um, for instance, you can see that there's a stone carving of Vitella on the Southeast Mandapa. And uh, typically he has uh, 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 his hands, which are um, in, in that kind of formation. And it seems holding a conch in one hand and the other hand is uh, pointing uh, downwards and say, things like that. And there's maybe some variations. And it's interesting, though, that uh, the uh, usefulness also of these kind of 3D prints and all that for teaching, because now you can actually go there and look quite uh, easily at one of the figures of uh, Vitella, which is actually there in the chariot shrine on uh, one of the uh, sides of it. And when you look into it closely, you can also see that it has a certain, you know, arch-like feature around it, which recollects a bit to some of the shapes that you saw in the, um, the, the Lotus Mahal kind of arches and things like that. Um, and so that level of detail is not that easy to pick up very easily, especially if you're just standing at the bottom and so on. So this is where the uh, 3D printing and all that actually facilitates, in my view, also the study of the art history and so on by making it accessible to look at some um, less accessible, uh, you know, renditions and sculptural forms and such like. And uh, one of the displays that was also there was of uh, the, the Ramachandra temple, um, which is also one of the prominent temples. And in this case, uh, so the, this entire complex itself had been um, um, 3D printed and so on. Of course, it's not the room size display, but a, a slightly smaller display in this case. And in a, it, this is also a, what, what is called a mixed reality display or so on, where you had this Kinect base um, uh, laser sensor pointer and so on. And as you're sort of wandering inside it, you get to uh, see some of the features uh, more closely and so on. For instance, here now it's it's gone to the point where the, it's, it's near the principal shrine and then you're looking out. So it shows you some of the features uh, as if, uh, which is then projected on that screen behind as if you were looking at it there and so on. So this was quite a popular exhibition and so on. And uh, of course the uh, um, Rama is, uh, also an avatar of Vishnu. And I mean, of course, the Vijayanagar rulers were very uh, prominent in their Vaishnava affiliations. I mean, I talked about the inspiration from the Cholas, but they were much more uh, inclined towards Shaivism, whereas uh, in the Vijayanagar period, it is uh, Vaishnavism, which is uh, celebrated and so on, much more in the sculptural forms. And you're looking here at one of the reliefs of uh, Rama with the bow and Sita and Lakshmana also with the bow and so on, which is in the Vitala temple. 
Now, I'll just briefly wanted to touch upon, but I won't go into this in too much detail here, uh, some of my past studies going back to my PhD work, which had been on the um, attempts to use um, uh, the metallurgical composition and the trace element composition and the metallurgical profile as a means of characterizing bronzes. And by uh, uh, because if, for instance, uh, a group of bronzes are made from similar sources of metal from, uh, the, you know, there are chances of the clustering together of certain elemental profiles and so on. I don't have time to go into it, but I will talk about this one technique which I use simply because they are helpful to pick out uh, maybe the differences uh, in composition, in the lead isotope ratio composition of uh, the Chola group from the Vijayanagara group. Uh, typically, lead isotope analysis is a powerful tool in archaeology because um, lead has this feature that the different ore deposits have different isotopic ratios, which is based on the uh, ore geochemistry of the formation of the ore at the time of formation, uh, you know, from uh, the um, uh, uranium thorium cycle and so on. And so what that means is that different ore sources actually have measurably different lead isotope ratios. So if the lead is used from different sources at different periods, there's a likelihood that you can tell apart uh, these uh, bronzes of different periods based on the lead isotope ratios. And it's just lucky for me that it turns out that the lead isotope ratios for a lot of the very uh, well um, dated and well attributed Chola bronzes uh, seem to be significantly different from the lead isotope ratios of the well-attributed uh, Vijayanagara bronzes, suggesting they were using different lead sources. We don't yet know exactly what that is, but anyway, those are more archaeometallurgical questions, which is not uh, what I'm going to be dwelling on here. But I wanted to point out uh, the implications of this for some of the stylistic attributions and then how it connects also with the digital work a bit more. Um, so... You're looking at the top at a uh, rather fine uh, Parvati image, uh, which is part of a Somaskanda set from Nidur, uh, which is in the Government Museum Chennai, which uh, uh, using the lead isotope ratio technique, I had fingerprinted to the Chola period, uh, which is about uh, 10th century or so. And uh, so that actually had about 12% uh, tin and 10% uh, lead. So it's a leaded bronze. And uh, that fitted this group one, which is really typically, uh, you know, connected with Chola pieces. But at the bottom, you're looking at this Rama image, which, uh, you know, you can also see that it has a bow and so on. And this Rama image is actually, now it's in the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, and this, of course, even art historians agree that this is a Vijayanagara era, you know, image. And this had the lead isotope ratios, which are distinct from Chola and fall into that group two, suggesting a different ore source. And so it's, it's datably, it, it also fits in terms of having these different clusters. And that image also is found to be a brass image with 21% zinc. So they're also using more of zinc in the later period in this uh, uh, Vijayanagara bronze, it seems. So now the significance of that, of course, is because it, of how it fits in with some of the uh, stylistic aspects of Vijayanagara sculpture, that particular Rama image. Um, and uh, now, the uh, as such, for instance, in the Chola period, you don't have too many um, standalone temples for the worship of Rama and so on. But this is something that you see quite prominently coming into uh, uh, vogue in the Vijayanagara period. You have, uh, and this is probably for the first time that you're seeing a full-fledged temple for Rama worship, the Hajara Rama temple, which was constructed in the early 15th century during the time of Devaraya of the Sangama dynasty. And there is an inscription inside the temple to this. And you also see, of course, there are these narrative friezes and so on, the depictions of the Ramayana. And uh, one of the sculptures in the shist, the black shist, you'll see it's of Rama, Sita, and Lakshmana with a bow. And that's a typical uh, depiction that you... Um, would also remember from that Vijayanagara piece that I was talking about. So the correlation between the stone sculptural rendition and the bronze uh, sculptural rendition, as it were. Um, and this is the, 
uh, as you go inside. And of course, this Hazara Rama temple, this is what was also modeled in that digital model that you saw and that scale model that you were looking at, uh, just to bring your mind back to that as well. Um, and this is the square Sabha Mandapa. You can see the four central pillars and uh, there is this um, elevated flooring. And the sanctum, of course, is empty. So we don't know exactly what was the nature of the deity inside which is being worshipped. But that small uh, frieze that I showed you is, 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 is along one of these columns. It's, it's quite a small relief of uh, showing uh, Rama, Sita and Lakshmana. Um, now... Another interesting aspect was that it's not that you don't have uh, images of uh, Rama worship in the Chola period. Um, at least, I mean, there are some well-known ones of the high Chola period of the 10th, 11th century. Um, but there is also this particularly uh, fine set of um, late Chola examples of uh, Rama, Sita and Lakshmana from Chengalpet in, uh, district in Tamil Nadu, which is now the government museum, uh, Thiruvelangaru. And... Uh, so from my technical fingerprinting, I had attributed to it, uh, it to about the 13th century. And what is interesting also is the, uh, if you look at the Talamana canon, I didn't want to, because I didn't have much time, I haven't gone into the actual casting of images and so on, but I've talked about those also in other talks on Chola bronzes and so on. But just to mention that the traditional way of modeling the image used the Talamana canon and in this case, this particular Rama image, if you look at it, it follows more of what one might describe as Ashtatala, which is associated with the idealized man. But it seems that when we come to the Vijayanagara period, the iconometry is slightly different. And it seems to be actually following the Dashatala canon, which is the Dashatala is, um, Ashtatala, of course, is the eight Tala proportions, but the uh, Dashatala is the ten uh, Talas. And in this case, uh, and of course, the tala is typically, um, uh, you know, the distance from the uh, the forehead to the chin. Uh, and that is how the image is uh, proportioned. And it's seen here that actually this particular Vijayanagara um, um, Rama image, which I had also technically fingerprinted and found it to fit the Vijayanagara uh, profile, that actually follows a Dashatala canon, which is associated more with... Uh, uh, the images of, of the major deities like Vishnu. So it seems that maybe the Rama image of the Chola period followed more of what is, you know, the idealized man maybe as a prince. And by the Vijayanagara period, he's become, the stature is more of a god king. So perhaps it also, you know, is a reflection of the fact that the cultic significance uh, of the Rama image, uh, you know, is much more in the Vijayanagara period and he becomes more of a major deity. So, well, these are the ways in which we can attempt to undertake interpretations and so on from the uh, the modeling and such like. Um, and uh, it's also interesting that uh, in the Vijayanagara period, you also see some of the portrait bronzes coming into vogue. Um, and... Uh, of course, in the Naika period, you also see portrait sculptures of the rulers as devotees and so on. Uh, but already here in um, uh, the Vijayanagara period, there's a very uh, spectacular and well-known set of uh, inscribed bronzes of Krishna Devaraya and his two wives, Chinnama Devi and Tirmala Devi. And uh, so this is said to have been presented to the Tirmala temple in 1518. And... Uh, so you can see that it's it's still there in, in, in worship in the Tirumala Tirupati temple. And so we had also undertaken some iconometric studies on uh, some of the images in the Kamalapura Museum. There is a stone image of Krishna Devaraya, of course, the head is missing, uh, which you can see that the uh, hands are again, in, you know, folded in, in the shape of a devotee. Um, and there's also one of a queen, and you can see that her head, you know, has a similar bun in the way that the uh, bronze has. And uh, again, uh, you know, one can get some insights into the Talamana canon used, and maybe it also, you know, and how to compare with the bronze and stone. So these are all dimensions of further worship. But what is quite interesting also is if you look at the the uh, crown that Krishna Devadaya is wearing, because in the earlier period, in, in what you see in the actual um, deities, you see this very elaborate crown, which is uh, uh, more like what you would associate with a prince or a, or, or a ruler and so on. Whereas um, Krishna Devara is actually wearing something which uh, 
looks a lot more like what is described as a kulai, which is also worn by Persian merchants and so on. And uh, in fact, I think it would, if, if some of you have also seen the Ottoman uh, Sufi dervishes, they seem to wear something like that, which is a bit similar to that. So it's an interesting example of certain cosmopolitan influences. And yes, I have this, in fact, uh, painting from a Lepakshi mural, which depicts this uh, Kulai cap, which is associated much more with the uh, Deccani Muslim or Persian inspired style and so on. So it's interesting that uh, there are all these um, variations. And at the same time, the iconometry of Krishnadevaraya also seems to be more of a Dashatala, which is again, what I was talking about in the Rama image. So it is also, you know, this conflation with of the ruler with the god king is something which uh, seems to also, you know, possibly also be an underlying theme there, though he is a devotee. And um, now I'll also come to another very interesting uh, um, iconography here at uh, Hampi, which is of the Lakshmi Narayana, because there's a very uh, spectacular, colossal Lakshmi Narayana image. Um, I think I have another 10, 15 minutes of talk, Anandya, but I'll try to go through it quickly if I'm going over time. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, it'll be nice to have more discussions, perhaps. So, so you'd like me to uh, sort of... Um, uh, in another maybe five, seven minutes? Five, seven minutes. Okay. Well, um, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. If so, uh, yeah, if it's possible. <laughs> so, um, Another um, imagery that I uh, had talked about the lead isotope analysis and so on. So this here is another image of uh, uh, Varaha or uh, uh, Vishnu as the avatar of the boar with the consort. And that was also technically fingerprinted to the Vijayanagara period that had 2.6% lead and 2.5% tin. And um, in the middle, you're looking here, you, know, you, you also have the stone depiction of the Lakshmi Narayana of the consort with um, um, with Vishnu here in this case. So this kind of theme of the of the deity and the consort is something which uh, is quite common in the Vijayanagara period. And this is, of course, a different kind of building material, uh, but a similar kind of uh, maybe in this case, the Panchatala proportion and so on. And now we come to the famous uh, Narasimha temple, which the inscriptions suggest that it was built in 1528 towards the end of the reign of uh, Vijayanagara, uh, of Krishnadevaraya. And he also patronized the worship of Narasimha at Ahobilam. And this was, of course, very famously vandalized in the sack of Talikota. And uh, there was a, 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 a um, um, you know, the, the sack of Talikota by the Deccan uh, Sultanate. And there was also a prominent image of Lakshmi seated on the lap of uh, Narasimha, which was completely knocked off. And you can see the bits of it. And if you look at this, uh, of course, photograph from the Alkazi collection, which is uh, by Nicholas and Co. An album in print of 1880s. You'll see that um, you know um, there was a lot of overgrowth and all, but it was actually um, thereafter restored in the 80s by uh, Nagaraj Rao and so on. And so, what you're seeing now with the yoga patta and some of the knees and all that is is a later restoration. It wasn't part of the original image, so it is not a yoga narasimha as often said, but it's a Lakshmi narasimha. And just to give you a comparison, this is a bronze in the Chandragiri collection, which also shows um, uh, a narasimha with uh, the seated uh, Lakshmi. And uh, so one of the things we'd also done was a laser scanning of this uh, Lakshmi Narasimha image. And uh, again, found this to be of this uh, Panchatala, uh, you know, proportion, which is related to the uh, less uh, prominent deities or so on. And you can also see the missing hand of Lakshmi. And this also shows you again how the laser scanning helps you to look more closely at the features and such like. Um, and you can also see the rear of the image, which is not so accessible. And you can see that very beautiful um, hand of uh, Lakshmi just at the back with the fingers. Um, of course, you can walk around and see it, but it's the, the, the proportions of it are quite nicely captured in that laser scan. And in this case, uh, Narasimha is also seated on the serpent. And again, that's a theme which you also see in, um, uh, in, in Lepakshi the Virabhadra temple in Lepakshi, which is attributed to about 1530, uh, and said to have been built by Virupana Nayaka, who's a Vijayanagara feudatory. And uh, again, some more of these iconometric studies, but I think we've talked a lot about this, so I won't uh, dwell on this too much now. 
um, also talking here, there's also an image of the Yoga Narasimha using another kind of stone here, the green schist and so on. Uh, so you do have the Yoga Narasimha image as well, apart from the Lakshmi Narasimha. And I, I, again, I won't dwell on this, but I'd also done some work on actually trying to look at the copper sources. And in North Karnataka, you do have a uh, copper source. This is some studies on some copper slags, and there is some uh, evidence for ore washing and uh, beneficiation and using pestles and so on. So this is, again, I won't touch on this too much, except to say that there's some um, copper slag. And finally, just very briefly, uh, since I think, as Anania said, I'm probably running out of time, I'll just touch upon the aspect of the interest in the musical pillars in Humpy, which um, uh, we talked about these colonnades and so on. I mean, and not all of this uh, these kinds of colonnades are musical. For instance, the Malaya Vanta Raghunatha, they're not very musical. But in, in the Vitala temple, they do give off these resonant properties where it in fact seems to match the um, iconography of the sculptures. For instance, there's a drummer over here in the front and at the back you have these colonnades and they give off these sonorous sounds of the drum. And you can also put your ear there and you get this resonant uh, sound of a drum. So I think also there's, you, you know, they, the craftspeople would have been good at selecting perhaps the, the quarries of the stones where they gave off more of a resonant, uh, you know, uh, sound than some of the others. And this is another famous set of the sculptures known as the uh, really related to the cymbal playing. And these rhombus shaped uh, colonnades at the back, they give off these sounds of the cymbal. Now, uh, looking at it quite intuitively, of course, you know, if, if they do to, to some extent follow the principle of a tuning fork, where if you have one side of the colonnades, which is very strongly pa packed, and the other side is more loosely packed, then that leads to some flexural vibrations, which can give off uh, tonalities and so on. And at the bottom, uh, one of the displays last year was also of this 3D print of this uh, cymbal player. And that was also a mixed reality display where if you tapped one of the pillars, then you could also put on the set of headphones and get the, the, the sounds related to this um, pillar. But what I was going to say was the actual uh, properties of the rock is also responsible for the tonality because this is a thin section of this pink porphyry granite from Humpy, which uh, I had undertaken um, here at NIAS, also with the collaboration of uh, Dr. Sajid Krishnan and IIC. And you can see that it has a lot of uh, content of orthoclase, which is a potassium feldspar. And it has these cleavage lines, which are at right angles, and it's a straight fracture and monoclinic structure and so on. So some of this resonant uh, properties is also, I think, probably because of this lining up of the these uh, monoclinic uh, uh, crystals and so on. Because that's also what I don't want to go into here, but Martin Sittik, uh, bronze and Martin Sittik steel, which gives off tonalities, also has a similar kind of lining of needle-like shapes and so on. And uh, this was a study, I won't go into it here, but just to point out that our past director, who was also heading IGCAR at some time, had uh, also undertaken a study, Dr. Baldev Raj, to look at the um, vibration analysis by using accelerometers uh, you know, which generates voltage signals which are proportionate to the amount and frequency of the vibration. And so that was used to uh, uh, explore, you know, what might have been going on in terms of the flexural vibration. So, you know, if you model this pillar as a bar which is clamped, then, you know, so they were able to say that it has these collective vibration modes and there's some resonance going on, coupling and resonance between the columns which contributed to the uh, tonalities. And finally, of course, coming back to Hire Benkel, this very spectacular site, because this is all, you know, to some extent disappearing in a way. And how do you get these slabs? Because, you know, we can imagine that, uh, you know, it's not that easy to actually um, cut it like this into slabs. Well, actually, they didn't have to cut it in slabs because the thing is in this part of the uh, region, the porphyritic granite is in really a thin layer on the surface like this. So the, the, the slabbing is natural, as you can see here. It just forms large, uh, due to the spalling action, it is actually formed in the form of large slabs. So they would have had to just... Uh, you know, cut it along the cracks, which they use various techniques. And in fact, I, there's there's a TEDx video. The, these slabs also have a very resonant property. And uh, there was one part where, you know, it seemed like there was um, a little block which, 
gives off all these tonalities and this is just my imagination that this lab could have been used for a performance and there's a TEDx in fact that I've done on that because the entire even the flooring sort of resonates and this was a French lithophonist Sebastian Sauvage who was experimenting and he also agreed with uh, you know he's been looking at lithophones in the Alps also and found these kinds of tonalities also here which is uh, very striking if, if you've been to Hire Benkel. And talking about these slabs and the spalling, as we call it, um, you know, so there are these, these cracks along, uh, which is the, the, the spalling of granite happens as a natural process over time. So they would have taken advantage of these kind of fissures and then put these, um, you know, the, 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 the wedges with uh, uh, wet wood, which, you know, when it expands, it tends to break the rock. And you also see that there are these uh, very large chisels, which you find in the Kamlapur Museum. Some of them are a foot large. I haven't had a chance to study them, but clearly there was um, a lot of use of, because this granite is a very intractable material, which uh, would have taken some uh, doing to really carve and so on. So I think with that, I shall end here. And there are a lot of people to thank over this journey, of course, but uh, also to remember Professor Shetter again, who uh, we lost last year, and some of my other colleagues who are now not that active, but uh, played um, quite a role in terms of uh, getting the teams together and so on. Uh, Professor Ranganathan and, and several of my other colleagues from uh, the various museums that supported uh, uh, the work over the years and um, some of the RAs and so on. So thank you very much. And uh, so shall I stop sharing there, Anindya? Yes, please, if you could. Yeah. Um, right. Do I just escape, right? Yeah, I think it, there'll be a stop sharing. Ah, oh, so right here, right? Okay. Yeah. Stop sharing. Wonderful. Yeah. So thank, thank you very much, Sharada, for a, a very, a very, very illuminating and a wonderfully uh, artistic talk. Uh, the uh, We are now open for comments, discussions, critiques, questions. Please go ahead and unmute yourself uh, and ask. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Aruna. Uh, yes, Professor Sarada, that was an interesting talk. I have a question about uh, in Kanchipuram, there's a Kailas Nath temple. I don't know if you've been there. When I went there, I was told that uh, Kailas Nath Temple was more or less the model for Belur Halabidu. But I was wondering, where does Hampi figure in here? Kanchipuram period was probably 800. Yeah, uh, so anyway, um, nice to have Dr. Arunan joining us, who's actually from IIC Anandir, so we're actually having a scientist uh, <laughs> from our neighboring <laughs> campus. That's nice to know. Thank you. That's, so actually, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, so Kanchipuram, actually it wasn't Belur Halibid because uh, period-wise Belur Halibid is a bit later, but Kanchipuram, uh, the connection is with the Chalukyan uh, period, which mm -hmm. is around uh, the same time, seventh. Um, uh, the, of course, the Chalukyan uh, temple building experiments, in fact, go back to about the 6th century around Badami and Aihole and Patakal and so on. And uh, so there was all this sort of rivalry between the Pallavas and the Chalukyas and so on. And that's how there was a lot of toing and froing of motifs and so on. So, and, and the Kailas Natha, um, yes, I, I think one of the temples at uh, Patlakal has uh, quite a bit of connection with uh, Kailas Natha in terms of, and uh, uh, that is where, of course, in, in Mahavalipuram, you see for the first time, Mahavalipuram is, is, is a bit uh, earlier, of course, the mid uh, sixth century, uh, mid seventh century, around six, um, uh, 650 to 80 or so, around which time, of course, Narasimha Varman Pallava was more active. And at that time, you have the first experiment of executing a temple as a monolith in this very hard Shanakite. So this is a monolithic excavation, but you have for the first time this Dravida style coming in with the tiered roof. And what you're seeing at uh, Kanchipuram and the Shore Temple is for the first time that third roof temple becomes a proper uh, 
structural temple. I mean, it's built of, of elements rather than as a monolith. So yes, that structural temple that you see at um, Kailasanatha, that's the model, I guess, for a lot of the temple building and so on. And your question is to uh, Hampi, of course, it's much later. So the Hampi, more, the Jenagara rulers uh, were more, it is quite interesting because they had the Hoysalas also, that uh, the Hoysala milieu was also there, but somehow they consciously looked towards the, the, I think the Chola temple building tradition to some extent, and even the bronzes and so on. So that is what they seem to have um, adopted in what might be some art historians like George Michel have described as a neo-Chola kind of style, you know, reviving that, which perhaps was seen as some kind of classical model. I don't know. So that's an interesting aspect. Anyway, I don't want to make the question a lecture in itself or the answer to the question. So thank anyway. you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, there's a question or a comment from Dr. Manavendra Singh. Hi. You go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. This is a this is a very non-specialist uh, question, but I was intrigued by that chart you showed with the lead isotope um, uh, chart that you had. I was very intrigued by it. Basically, I was I wanted to know. Um, has, has there been a uh, sort of is there a record of where the lead was sourced from? I'm you know in terms of where it was where it was uh, gathered from, mined from. Because I'm looking at it in terms of you know the capability of an establishment and administration, or a state you know some, a state that made humpy or uh, an establishment and administration that sustained these uh, empires and where they source their uh, you know such crucial elements from, and that spread of their trade uh, excavations is something that uh, you know i was in interested in knowing and i know it's not the focus of the uh, article your thing today but it's something that intrigued me thank you well first of all thank you so much uh, dr manvendra for joining from i'm sure your very busy schedules and things um and uh, i should say that uh, Yes, so I couldn't go into that here, so it perhaps deserved a full talk to explain. Um, and I think that, you know, the, 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 the point is that the, um, what, what we can figure out now is, is the, the ways in which some of the objects are clustering together. But to actually identify the ore sources, we need to have an exhaustive um, uh, data bank of lead isotope ratios for ore sources around India. And we don't actually have that, not just India, but elsewhere around the world. So in a way, it is an exclusionary kind of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, thing, because if you know that it doesn't match a particular uh, ore site, then you can exclude that site perhaps as a source, though of course it could be other factors. And actually, usually sometimes I also put in uh, a broader lead isotope ratio plot, which, for instance, also shows some of the uh, lead isotope ratios of ore sources in uh, Western India and so on. And uh, interestingly, one object that I, I did analyze, which is from the 18th century Maratha period, actually had lead isotope ratios which fitted Dariba. But sometimes if you listen to one of the talks, which focuses more on South Indian bronzes, Dariba, I think, it, it, Dariba is in Rajasthan. So yes. clearly the Aravalli region and so on, Rajasthan, which you're familiar with, is would have been, uh, is known to have had a lot of um, lead uh, ores. And, and Dariba also had uh, lead mines, apart from, of course, our where we have the earliest evidence for zinc and so on. But that particular image that I showed you with 21% zinc, that was not uh, Zawar. It did not fit Zawar. So we, there must have been other sources as well. And we don't know enough also about peninsular India. I did find some matches with uh, a, a one site in Andhra Pradesh in terms of the lead uh, from the Shatavahana period. That's much earlier. But there is still, I think, a lot more to be done there in this whole study. And I think it, it deserves a more comprehensive um, study, which also involves, you know, the places which have mines and all. So, yes, it's an interesting question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharda. Is there a question from uh, Dr. Meera Natumpalli? Uh, Sharda, yes, uh, it was nice uh, listening to your uh, presentation. Just wanted to know, um, uh, when you said about Krishna Devaraya outfit, when it ca came to that Persian influence was there in the costume. So yeah. I just wanted to know that uh, were there Persian settlement in Hampi and uh, do you have any, I mean, evidence of the traces of the settlement? Because 
I see that Abdul Razak also was an ambassador who was um, trading during 1400. And uh, so we do see a lot of Persian influence. So do you think that any any of the study shows any Persian uh, settlement in Hampi? Yeah, well, it's, it's an interesting question. And by the way, let me also um, uh, mention here, Meena, Meena Natapali, who I mentioned, is also an adjunct faculty now at NIAS, and she was also closely involved with some of the uh, digital uh, reconstructions and so on. Yes, well, in fact, that uh, particular Kulai cap was uh, was from uh, Lepakshi. And as I said, it, it is Persian, but it also has, to my mind, also has some Ottoman kind of uh, connections as well. You know, as similar, as I said, I don't know if you've seen the Sufis, <laughs> the Darwishes from uh, Turkey, that's exactly what they were. So, yes, it is that um, kind of uh, uh, attire. And, uh, you know, certainly there were Persians, uh, I mean, the connections of the Deccan Sultanates with uh, Persians coming and living and so on is also quite, uh, you know, well known and recorded and established. So perhaps from there, there was some amount of interaction. And, uh, you know, as, as far as Lepakshi is concerned, some of the, the detail in the textiles and so on, I mean, there's even been um, speculation about Venetian traders and, you know, certainly the Persian influence in the textiles also, you know, Masuli Patnam, the, uh, the uh, Kalamkari, Kalam itself, the term is a Persian word, the Kalam, you know, so it's thought that there's a link also there with the textile tradition and Kalamkari. So I think definitely in the Deccan there is, there were, and I think Hampi, Hampi actually also has some prominent uh, mosques as well. It's not just temples. So the, the Vijayanagara rulers had also built these mosques for, uh, you know, and probably some of these visiting uh, emissaries or couples back and so on could have used. So I think that's another area for interesting area for further steps. Thanks for that. Yeah, uh, actually, you see that uh, in um, Zanana enclosure and even in Hazara, uh, when it says, these are all Persian, uh, I mean, words which... Uh, explain some of the things. So that's why I was just wondering if you have traced some evidences of the Persian settlement. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Sharada. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, of course, my work is more on the archaeometallurgy and archaeogeology. So, but I think the settlement yeah, I know. And all that is another interesting aspect, which, uh, you know, as an extension, it certainly um, ought to be, you know, explored further. Things. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there other questions or comments? No? So in that case, um, thank you very much, Sharada, for a wonderful talk, as always. And I can always depend on you to make to make an exciting presentation which always attracts the audience and there's so many questions that get raised and thank you very much uh, each member of the audience for being here for raising questions for your comments and i know we are going through difficult times but i hope that uh, we will continue with these presentations some perhaps physically as the institute opens up some perhaps online and i invite all of you to join our Wednesday discussions whenever possible. So thank you once again. I also wanted to express my thanks to Guru and to uh, Ramki, Ramakrishna, for organizing Wednesday talks along with me. So thank you once again, everyone. Thank you so much in India, and um, always a pleasure to have this interaction. And, and good to see you all also, even if it's only in the Zooms, and have your presence here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye.